Well, thanks very much, and thank you for inviting me uh, to give this uh, talk. It's a kind of a difficult talk to give. There's a Cosmo angle. There's people who know this experiment already, want to see uh, the updates and things. So uh, it'll, it'll probably be where everybody is slightly dissatisfied with what I'm saying, which is, would be a huge success in my mind. Um, so let me go start at the beginning. Uh, the standard model does not explain everything about physics, that's for sure because there's plenty of physics that has really nothing to do with this particle physics, but it doesn't even explain everything about particle physics. And there are some key questions that are unresolved. Uh, one is dark matter. Um, we know that dark matter exists. There's lots of evidence for this, um, but we don't know what it is. Uh, there is a number of, of, of ideas of what it could be. Axion's one. Uh, there is the WIMP, uh, which is a stable particle around 1 TeV. It's kind of a natural candidate uh, for dark matter. Yet, at least so far, the direct detection uh, experiments, which are absolutely fantastic, have not uh, seen. They put bounds on the uh, cross-section mass uh, in this cross-section mass phase space. Uh, Lux is the currently current best bound. Um, this will get improved, but right now, uh, no dice. We don't know what uh, dark matter is. Um, yet, it is 27% uh, of the mass of the universe, at least today. Um, and uh, it's stable, electrically neutral. Uh, we'll have to see. Um, what it is. So this is a pretty big unanswered question in physics of which the standard model does not address. Another uh, uh, key unresolved question is the matter-antimatter asymmetry. So we live in uh, this kind of universe, not this uh, Star Trek type uh, anti-universe. Uh, and uh, there's a kind of a general framework for describing how this might have come to be uh, by, uh, given by Sakharov. One key ingredient for that is CP violation or time reversal violation under CPT uh, symmetry. Uh, CP violation exists in the standard model. It's been seen. Um, but there's not enough CP uh, violation in the standard model to explain our universe. There's just not, uh, there's not enough uh, matrix element there, so to speak. So the observed matter-antimatter asymmetry, it requires time reversal violation and it requires new sources of this time reversal violation beyond the standard model. Another second big question in physics that's not resolved. Now, there are a number of, uh, that's a, this is a very general uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, idea of what you need. CP violation is one ingredient. Another uh, ingredient is some kind of out of equilibrium kind of phase transition or something. But that happens all the time in kind of any, any uh, model of, of the Big Bang. So uh, just one particular uh, uh, model for uh, or explain the matter-antimatter asymmetry is this electroweak baryogenesis. And uh, you'll see there's, there's quotes from the, the papers by Ramsey Musloff. Um, basically, the idea is that uh, EDMs, and I'll explain why in just, in, in just a bit, can impact on this, uh, try to uh, observe enough time reversal violation to, just, uh, to answer this question within a specific model. So this is real theory that can be tested. OK, that's a uh, second uh, uh, question. The third I, I, I feel uncomfortable about because it's just uncomfortable, the, uh, the naturalness of the Higgs uh, mass. It's a problem, but it's kind of, well, this may be nature. right? It may be that the Higgs mass is what it is, and there's no new physics all the way up to the, the Planck scale. There are some solutions to this quote unquote problem, this uncomfortableness. Uh, one is uh, supersymmetry. Um, another is fine-tuning. It could be that the universe is fine-tuned all the way up to the Planck scale. So what? No big deal. Q theta QCD is really, really small. OK, that's life. Nothing we can do about it. Or these kind of ideas of extra dimensions. Um, so the idea with a supersymmetry is that there's some particles that are kind of near the Higgs mass which suppress this divergence, uh, this uh, quadratic uh, divergence due to radiative corrections. So that gives a Higgs mass which is kind of near the mass of the new particles that might exist, these supersymmetric particles. So the possible solution, as I just alluded to, is that we take the standard model and we add some new particles to it. Um, that's great. Uh, the kind of going theory, or we'll call it the generic framework to understand uh, these extensions to the standard model that solve all of these problems, uh, is supersymmetry. And it provides, uh, naturally, the unnecessary T violation for matter-antimatter asymmetry. It provides the answer to the unification hierarchy problem and provides a candidate for dark matter. Now, it may be that whatever nature gives us, only 
in, in, in that's maybe that Susie is right, but it only gives us the answer to one of these. Right? It may be that the matter antimatter asymmetry comes from something completely different. Nonetheless, you do have this kind of simple theory, relatively simple theory, which does solve all of these problems simultaneously. So uh, here's a whole lots of good words, but let me just uh, write down here. Uh, this is a theory paper um, by Pospilov and uh, Ritz and co-worker McKean. In the end, we find that current EDM bounds probe energy scales of 0.1 PeV uh, or higher. So it solves all these problems, and just from a uh, just experimentalist point of view, you're kind of poking around at much higher energies than the LHC will ever reach. So that sounds like a good reason to do EDM experiments, just based on that statement alone. The question is, how does that happen? How does the EDM tell us about this? It's fairly simple, is that the, the electron, this is the EDM of the electron, there's also nuclear EDMs, which I'll mention later. The electron is kind of like a little antenna. It picks up the presence of these new particles. And that's it. So if these particles exist, they, you can either make them directly at the LHC, or guess what? They're around every electron here in this room. And so the question is, can we be sensitive enough to figure, uh, to measure uh, the presence of these new particles? Well, we already know uh, that uh, the virtual particles exist around the electron. The electron is dressed by, vir uh, by virtual particles. This has uh, come out in G minus two measurements. What you see here is the, uh, the cloud, the symmetric cloud uh, around the electron. It's this kind of diagram. And uh, actually, Jerry's here in the audience. He's done an incredible job of uh, confirming the standard model QED to a part per trillion uh, level. So it, it's there, right? Virtual particles exist. I don't have to really convince uh, anybody of that. And these, uh, these experiments are continuing to, to go on, getting more and more accurate. Um, so it's really quite impressive. So here, if we instead think about if there's new SUSY particles, what happens? Well, you have a very similar diagram, except that you have uh, this new particle we'll call it particle X. And I don't know how well this comes out on this screen, but you can see I'll toggle between. So there is uh, the, 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 dre the, the photon dressing. There we go. So when you have uh, these SUSY particles, generically, that creates an EDM. There's a little bit of asymmetry introduced, and this asymmetry must be along the spin axis. Otherwise, there's an extra quantum number, and uh, life gets uh, very different than to what we observe. So the new SUSY particle will, uh, will create this EDM, and it's aligned along the spin axis, so we just need to look for it. So what would be the size of this? Well, you can just make kind of a generic kind of dimensional analysis uh, based on this kind of single loop diagram. One assumes that this phase, this, you can think of this phase, this phase is um, like in the CKM matrix, there's a phase. Um, which can uh, give rise to uh, CP violation. Generically, there's no reason to think this phase, if there's a new set of particles, this phase or phases uh, is anything but one, but it's possible the nature has conspired to make this very small. That would be a new kind of fine tuning. But if this phase is, in fact, near one, uh, one has a kind of generic coupling constant, a mass, which is kind of near uh, the Higgs mass, then one can calculate just through dimensional analysis for some kind of end loop. So here, n will equal 1 for this diagram, that the EDM is about 10 to the minus 25 e centimeters. But that is uh, 100 times the previous EDM limit. This means previous to the ACME experiment, which I'll, I'll be talking about today. So the question is, well, before we ever got involved with EDMs, uh, there uh, was already a problem with this very simple idea of supersymmetry. Um, so what the heck was going on? Nobody, you know, who knows? <laughs> Just Emilio Estevez. Yeah. <laughs> so um, here is a kind of a, kind of a theory EDM plot. Let me explain this. Here's EDM in this units of e centimeters. That's the units that we use in the field. Here's the excluded region, excluded by experiment. And here are some number of theories. I've blocked out the names because it's all very confusing. But here is what we call naive Susy. That's this diagram here. And so. Already before ACME, uh, there were experiments which made what we'll call naive SUSY or, or minimal supersymmetric models kind of uncomfortable in a different way. And uh, this, going from here to here, from 10 to minus 22 to around 10 to minus 27, was 50 years of experimental progress. So there a lot of work went into this, including uh, work uh, by Dave DeMille on the thallium experiment, which uh, gives us that blue line uh, right there. Uh, there was a later experiment done uh, with molecules 
uh, which is that green line uh, right there. And the ACME experiment is kind of, you know, the next generation, so to speak, of, uh, of these pioneering experiments uh, that were uh, led by Ed Hines. Okay. So uh, our lab for looking for the EDM of the electron is this. It's this molecule. Uh, there it is, the artist depiction of the molecule. Uh, the state that we're using the molecule is triplet delta one state. And you may or may not uh, know about this particular quantum number. Uh, most atomic physicists say, oh, oh, yeah, I guess I kind of remember that from some kind of class. This is the projection of the angular momentum along the internuclear axis. So it's a, la a molecule frame uh, angular momentum. And it's a perfectly fine uh, quantum number. But remember also that we have the lab frame, uh, uh, switch these, J and MJ, uh, the angular momentum in, uh, in the lab frame. So this uh, quantum number we'll be mentioning uh, a, a little bit later. This uh, THO molecule is, is a fairly simple and very well understood molecule. Uh, a lot of spectroscopy was done on this. A lot of work was done on the chemistry. For a molecule, if anybody's like looked into literature for a given molecule, there's almost nothing there. And the chemist kind of, you know, eh, eh. you know, how many, which, how many are we making? We don't know. Eh. But thorium oxide was different. And you can imagine in your head why, because thorium is a lot like uranium. So there were probably a few billion dollars of work put into uh, understanding thorium and its oxides, which turned out to be great for us. So we're going to use this uh, to uh, use this molecule to search for an EDM. Uh, what is good about the molecule? You have this kind of natural asymmetric electric field distribution. That's due to the magic of chemical bonding. There's a strong electric field in there. And so uh, you can use that strong electric field to, uh, to interact with whatever uh, EDM, electron EDM might exist. And that's determined the Hamiltonian that you're interested in. So that was, that's really good about a molecule. Bad, well, here's the Hamiltonian for the molecule. And then down here it says terms non-diagonal in S. So this is not atomic hydrogen. It's a complicated beast. Yet, remember, it still is quantized. So you can make something more and more and more uncomplicated. What just happens is the levels get closer and closer together. There's more levels per energy spacing, but it's still quantized in a sense. Not, excuse me, not in a sense. It is still quantized, and we can, we can use that fact. So that's bad. And then there's also the challenge. Just working with molecules is a pain. They're harder to produce, manipulate, work with. Uh, it's, it's just very difficult, uh, and really it has to do with this kind of diagram. There's lots of rotations, there's lots of vibrations, um, there's high-order couplings, etc. Okay, so let's just go with the basics here. We're going to take this molecule, and we're going to put it in an electric field. Uh, what happens? Well, for thorium, uh, thorium oxide, something very, very nice happens even at a low electric fields. Here's the applied electric field, and this is the degree of polarization of the molecule. And because the molecule inherently has two very closely spaced um, opposite parity levels, even with small fields, we can fully polarize it in the lab. So here's our fully polarized molecule. This red uh, arrow is the applied electric field. And here's the electron sitting inside of the molecule. So if we take uh, thorium oxide again in this H state, this triplet delta one state, the levels break up uh, in this way. Here's the applied electric field, excuse me, this is the applied electric field here. Here's the effective electric field within the molecule. Uh, here is that quantum number omega, the projection uh, of the angular momentum along the internuclear axis. Here's mj, mj minus 1, these states, mj plus 1 are these states. And these correspond to the orientation of the ele electron within the effective electric field of the molecule. And we're just going to ignore these states for now. So that's great. Um, so all we've done so far is put it in the, uh, in the electric field. We can use spectroscopy to address only these states or only these states. So we have a beam of molecules. We can study these states. We can study these states and very clearly, uh, cleanly separate that interaction by simply tuning laser frequency and making sure our lasers are narrow, making sure that these are split by enough, et cetera. What that means is that in this, this short explanation, we can just ignore these levels for the moment. So this is now just these two levels that we're going to uh, focus on for the, uh, uh, for the molecule. The molecule is polarized in the same direction for these two levels, but the electron is pointing in a different direction within the molecule. So then we add the EDM. What does that do? Uh, here is this effective uh, electric field. And so we have this term in the Hamiltonian minus DE. This is 
uh, what we hope is the electric dipole moment uh, times the effective electric field. The effective electric field is on the order of 10 to the 11 volts per centimeter. So it's extremely high. It's an atomic unit of electric field, and that's why we use this. We use an atom or molecule because we can, we can get a much, much higher electric field than is available by taking two plates and putting a battery on it. So uh, you add that term to the Hamiltonian, these two levels shift, and so you have a, a, a two-level system, and you're going to do a spin precession uh, measurement. Now I've got to remember how much detail I was going to give here. Right. So I'm not going to talk about how to do a spin precession measurement because I wouldn't have time to go and do everything else. So I'm sweeping all that under the rug. Um, not under the rug. I'm putting that off to the side. It's still there. I'm not trying to hide it. It's just a spin precession measurement. Um, but uh, the question is, OK, so we, 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 we can do this spin precession measurement, but how do we actually get the electron EDM out of that? And uh, uh, one of the, the things uh, we do is we try to, um, I should have put in that previous slide, now I know. What we try to do is we try to cleanly extract the effects of only the electron EDM. And the way we do that is we uh, say we do the experiment, we do a spin precession experiment on the electron in this configuration with the applied electric field this way. And then we do the experiment again with the applied electric field in this direction without changing our laser frequency. And what that corresponds to is that you can see the switch in the direction of the spin of the electron versus the uh, internal electric field of the molecule. Here it's pointing one way, here it's pointing the other way. So now, from this point forward, you just have two configurations. Here's the spin, here's the electric field. You do the experiment this way and do the experiment that way. And you measure the phase precession of the, of the electron. You subtract those two to create this thing, which is called P minus, is what we call a parity sum. And in this parity sum, yep, in this parity sum, the leading term, we hope, will be uh, this electric, uh, electric dipole moment of the electron times the uh, effective electric field. There are these higher order terms. I'm not going to go over them. I have you know, 20 slides to describe all this and other talks, but I'm not going to go over them. But our job is to make sure that these terms are small. And it turns out, with even just this simple switch, this electric field switch, we can make these, uh, these higher order terms quite small. So that's how we get rid of the bad, you know, that complicated Hamiltonian. Fine, it's a complicated Hamiltonian. It makes the magnetic moment of the, uh, of the molecule extremely hard to calculate. You're never going to be able to measure it that accurately. Well, we kind of did, but you'd never be able to predict it that accurately. So what? We don't care. We just do these switches. And that's that electric field switch I was talking about. You can also switch the direction of a magnetic field. We can put the molecule in a combined electric and magnetic field. The electron spin will be processing around the magnetic field. We can switch the B field. And then we can also do what we call an end switch. The end switch was, oops, the end switch was changing the laser frequency from, from one uh, state to the other. So we have these different switches that we can do. And from this, we can kind of further and further, more finely isolate the EDM term. It also means we can get a whole lot of parity sums. You saw this one parity sum, which is just P minus. You've got eight combinations of parity sums that you can create out of this. But that actually helps you do the experiment. Where am I on time? OK. I think I'm OK. So uh, what does the experiment look like? Uh, it's in a room. Uh, the, uh, if we had a slightly bigger room, the entire experiment could be in a room. Uh, it's not that big of a room. Um, but uh, the, uh, it, right now, we have most of the experiment in the room. And then we have another room that has the lasers uh, in it, some of the lasers in it. And these are connected by fiber. But you can think of this as, well, this room would do. This room, this room would be great, actually. <laughs> Put a crane up there, and we're done. You know. Um, so we create molecules. I'll, uh, I'll run a movie in just a second. We create the molecules in this beam source. The molecules travel through this, this tube into uh, our Ramsey region. This is the, uh, the center of this beam source. Here, we're going to prepare the uh, spin of the molecules and then read it out in that region. And here we have this wonderful movie. And so here is the uh, apparatus. Uh, the molecules will be created here. Uh, the way that we create the molecules is by sending a short pulse of, uh, of uh, YAG, uh, 532 plus 1064, I believe, onto these targets of THO2. Uh, you have a very 
a high intensity of uh, in a few nanoseconds. It creates an ablation plume, which has uh, drives THO and THO2 off into a kind of a plasma. The THO gets cooled by uh, neon gas to around uh, 20 Kelvin, 15, 20 Kelvin. A beam is formed. Uh, at, right here is the zone of freezing. So this really is a, just a you know, fine, low density uh, molecular beam. Uh, we do a little bit of uh, pumping to build up uh, population in one particular quantum state, that J equal one state. The molecules continue to travel, and then we prepare the spin of the electron within the molecule. Um, first, we optically pump from the ground state of the, of the molecule into that H state, that triplet delta one state uh, that we call the EDM state. Then we use polarized light to align uh, the electron uh, uh, spin within the molecule. Here in this region here, we have a parallel E and B fields. As the uh, molecule travels from here to here, the interaction of the electron spin with the, uh, sorry, of the electron magnetic moment with the magnetic field and the EDM with the electric field of the molecule will give it a phase shift. And then we read out uh, that phase shift by alternate, alternately applying two different polarizations very, very quickly switching back and forth and reading the photons that come out as the molecule is driven from this H state uh, to a higher line state, which then decays very quickly. That's our signal, these photon pulses at the two different quadratures of the... Um... Yeah. Okay, so this is what the data looks like. This is time after ablation, so we ablate, and then 10 milliseconds later, these molecules have traveled into the interaction region. And what you're seeing, this looks very noisy. While it's not noise, it's as we switch the polarizations, we pump the molecules uh, in one, uh, one, with one polarization and the other polarization. And then here we have the number uh, of photons collected in each one of those orthogonal uh, polarizations, and that's how we can get the, uh, the phase. Hope we're okay with that. So uh, how do we do the data analysis? Well, here we, what we do is we construct out of uh, the, 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 the number of photons in the two orthogonal, that came out in the two orthogonal directions when we pumped the molecule, we created a symmetry, which is essentially closely related to the phase. Uh, we bin it up, and uh, we get a distribution. This is data, our data analysis for, uh, for the EDM. Uh, it's very, very nice, and I don't know, somebody should say ooh and ah. I mean, this is Gaussian, <laughs> please. Yeah. Ooh ah, yeah. Uh, oh, there's another ooh ah moment coming up that nobody ooh ahs over except for the particle people. Anyways, so we, um, this is a very, very uh, clean uh, Gaussian, which is really uh, great. We do a blind offset, and then to get our fin uh, final EDM limit, uh, we uh, use this Feldman uh, Cousins uh, confidence interval intervals. So the statistical sensitivity, uh, it's a square root of n uh, experiment, simple counting experiment. Uh, we have a high effective electric field. Our coherence time is kind of on the order of one uh, millisecond. And this is kind of, uh, it's, a, it's, 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 it's good. You know, uh, if you had these molecules trapped, it would be on the order of one second. Uh, that would be great. Uh, but we have a lots and lots of molecules for a millisecond as opposed to just a few molecules at one second. Um, but the future of this may, in fact, be trapping in the future. So as far as doing this experiment, uh, uh, the well, our first version of the experiment, which we call ACME-1, I'll be telling you about that result in just a few minutes, our statistics uh, were good. Uh, the previous measurement was a uh, limit of uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 27. And the statistics uh, limit that we got um, you know, uh, before we unblinded, sorry, statistics limits that we, that we got was uh, something on the order of 4 times 10 to the minus 29. So that looked quite good. But as Mark said, this is all about systematics. Uh, the amount of data that went into this is about 100 hours of data, something like that. And you know, we didn't like, take the data and then publish a few weeks later. It took about a year to figure out all the systematics. We discovered a new one. Um, how do you uh, search for these systematics? Well, one thing you can do is just do extra switches, right? For example, one can let's just do the experiment at two different electric fields. This is actually the first time that an EDM experiment had been done at, these two, at two different electric fields, at least electron EDM experiment. We tried three different magnetic fields, and then we can like change the position of the leads going to the, our electric field plates, for example. The other thing we can do is we can vary lots of stuff, like we can vary things um, like uh, the, the, we can add a little gradient of the magnetic field in the chamber, okay? And so one can uh, vary some parameter x, take uh, data 
for a particular parity sum. I talked about one parity sum, which was the EDM channel, but there's lots of other parity sums. And so here are a bunch of different uh, parity sums. Here's a bunch of different parameters we can vary. Uh, and we go ahead and just do it. And then we fit this to a line and we see uh, whether there's a statistically significant variation. This plot here for all these different parity sums and all these different parameters, basically, if it's black or gray, it's fine. But these white blobs say that there's a significant correlation. Uh, and you have to go find out what that correlation is. And you have to solve that problem. And one of those problems took us six months. The other problems took us a lot shorter, which is good. Um, What's pretty cool about this, this is the statistical distribution of the diagnostic si signals from this systematic error search. Ooh. Yeah, thank you. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> so these, uh, these, are, uh, all under these were all understood and, and controlled. So this, there's a systematic uh, uh, table of systematics. You can get this kind of error here. This was the, the error, our systematic error here. The statistical was a 4.8. Uh, before we unblinded, this was our answer. And then when we unblinded, we got that. And so it was consistent with zero. And we were able to put a limit um, on the order of, uh, it was about 8 uh, times 10 to minus 29 e centimeters. So what does this mean? OK, so fine. We now improved uh, the EDM by uh, the limit by a factor of uh, 10. Um, and this is one way to interpret it. OK, there are a few other ways. I'll describe them. But here's, a, I like, like this in particular. This is within uh, supersymmetry. Here's a different uh, families of supersymmetric uh, partners. Uh, here, uh, this is the uh, supersymm particles that are supersymmetric to the top. This is where LHC is, completely, is really focused on. They're looking for the stop particle. Okay. And uh, when the Higgs mass was verified uh, by the LHC, uh, this uh, theory, this theory of supersymmetry, at least in this sector, became somewhat unnatural. That means that the stop was it had to be higher than it, 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 it was natural for it to be. It should be kind of near the Higgs, but it seems to be higher. And my understanding is it's, is it's high enough so that the LHC will not see it. What I'm saying is that if you just take the naive, uh, the naive calculation, the, the stop particle will have a higher mass than the LHC will access. But of course, of course, it may not be natural. Maybe there's some cancellations in there, and they'll see the stop tomorrow. We don't know. Um, here, that we're, uh, the EDM, electron EDM, is sensitive to the stop. And there's calculations going on now to see exactly how sensitive. Um, but uh, what we're certainly sensitive to are these uh, partners of the, uh, of the electrons, uh, selectrons. And so this was the previous EDM result. And now the, with the ACME result uh, that we moved up here. So we have certainly made things unnatural in this part of, of SUSY. Similarly, with the nuclear EDMs, they're kind of down here. Um, and they're working to get up here uh, to higher and higher uh, super partner mass sensitivities. Um, and it may be very uncomfortable for supersymmetry. It's already uncomfortable for supersymmetry. Uh, let me uh, say a little bit why. So here, what we have is an exclusion plot. The EDM will depend on this phase, the CP violating phase that I mentioned before. And of course, the mass. Uh, I gave that simple dimensional analysis formula. Here it is almost exactly the same. And what it's saying is that we are able to be, we're sensitive to these SUSY masses that are uh, around uh, 10 EV with this, um, uh, uh, sorry, about 3 to 10, 10 EV uh, with the, the, the single loop or the two loop. Uh, 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 diagrams. I'm going to skip this one. Uh, another way of looking at this, uh, one can do uh, come up with a minimal supersymmetric model and essentially vary parameters in these models and kind of came up with a statistical distribution of uh, uh, nuclear EDMs and electron EDMs that would come out of supersymmetry. That's what these, do these dots are, where it's very, very dark. That's where there's a lots of models that uh, would give this prediction. Where it's lighter and lighter, there's fewer models. And what we have done uh, with ACME-1 was to eliminate this part of phase space in this supersymmetric model space. So two thirds of the parameter space uh, for supersymmetry, simple supersymmetry, was excluded by previous EDM limits. ACME-1 uh, excluded two thirds of the remaining uh, space. So it's getting very, very tight uh, for supersymmetry. So uh, here it is a little bit different. Now we're horizontal with the electron EDM here. This vertical axis is time. So uh, here's 1990, 1994, and here's ACME. Um, that was published just at the beginning of 2014. And so this uh, new result 
you can see this was naive Susie, we've really left it pretty far behind. That if, 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 if uh, minimal supersymmetry uh, exists, that means that for some reason the CP violating phases are very, very small. And that in and of itself is odd, uh, unnatural, but it may, be, it may be the case. We'll just have to see. I'm going to skip this. Right, so the question is how did we do better than the previous experiments? Well, uh, here's a little table. Uh, here's previous uh, the thallium experiment, the YBF experiment. This was the Heinz group. Um, this was uh, the experiment that uh, Dave DeMille worked on in the Cummins group. And uh, there's something, a point I want to make here. Here I've listed the one day statistical sensitivity of these experiments. And then here's the published limit. So here we have a sensitivity around 10 to the minus 27, published limit around 10 to the minus 27. 2 times 10 to the minus 27, 1.5 times 10 to the minus 27. ACME, 1, the experiment you just saw, 1 times 10 to the minus 28. It's published limit, 1 times 10 to the minus 28. It's telling you something. Now, so I'm going to use this as a guide. The essential one day statistical limit is basically what one ends up publishing. So to get this improvement over the uh, YBF, uh, we have this new beam source, which I didn't mention too much about, but it, it, was, a, it was a new beam source. Uh, the molecule had ups and downs. Uh, one of the big ups is it had a much higher uh, internal electric field. And then there were some tech, what we call technical improvements, and that gave us a factor of 15. We got this nice paper, and uh, for this part of the talk, I just want to sum up. This is a, a Adam Ritz talk. Uh, the Susie CP volume vo problem hinted at one loop EDMs for more than 20 years has been confirmed by the LHC. <laughs> so thank you, LHC, for confirming what the, uh, what the EDMs had been telling us. Okay, I don't know, it's fine. So uh, we've improved the limit on the EDM uh, by one order of magnitude. Our limit constrains a T violating physics and the TEV energy scale, and we've uh, demonstrated improvements. That was the team that uh, did the ACME 1 uh, experiment. Big team, uh, over uh, seven, uh, eight, seven or eight years. Great, incredible group of people. So we're still hard at work now with ACME 2 and ACME 3 and acne super duper, <laughs> he's thinking. So why would you continue to go on? There's lots of reasons. Hopefully you kind of believe the first part. But here is a particular model of this electroweak uh, baryogenesis, this is kind of Cosmo type workshop. There's a model for that. And uh, here's EDM, here's the acne one result. And right now, you know, we're aiming to go down, you know, deep in this direction uh, for the next uh, measurement, hopefully down here. And basically it looks like the EDM uh, within uh, at least this, uh, this um, uh, Susie, uh, Susie model uh, will say something very, very strong about, uh, about uh, matter-antimatter symmetry. Either we find it, which means, hey, it could be that's the reason we have matter-antimatter symmetry, or we don't uh, find uh, the EDM in the next round, and uh, then it's saying, look, you've got to think of other models, theorists, because this isn't working. So, yep. Okay. So that mass scale... Five, okay. Okay. Excuse me? Yeah, so this is some this is kind of M1, and it's M1, it's some kind of some kind of combination of two masses, and I don't understand it. The same thing with this this phase of M1. I mean this is just Yeah, so the, oh no, this 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 is what they are saying within this model is that this is the allowed band, is the green. I, I can only point you to the paper. You know, it's some it's some particular electroweak uh, electroweak um, baryogenesis model. You know, I I couldn't quite this. I'm one, which is a really good question. It's like, well, it's some kind of combination of two masses within this model. You know, and all, also it's also kind of funny. This model, uh, you know, it has one of the phases. Uh, there's you know two Susy phases. It has one of the phases set to zero, and not the other, right? And it's like, well, why? Do you, I don't I don't know. But you know, these are our colleagues. They're, you know, they're theorists. And okay, so <laughs> this is um, uh, so our projected uh, Acme two uh, would push into this region. Uh, you'll notice that we are in the middle of split Susie, which is you know one uh, totally viable popular uh, theory. So I'm going out on a limb here and saying this is our. Uh, no, I, I'm I'm still holding on to the trunk of the tree. Wait till you see at the end of the talk. That's out on the limb. 
So this is our projected uh, one-day statistical sensitivity um, for uh, ACME2. Um, how are we going to get there? We're uh, changing the beamline uh, geometry. We're changing how we do state preparation. And we're changing uh, uh, aspects of the light collection and readout. Let's say go over these uh, very quickly. But I want to make a point. Uh, here's a slide. This is about five years old. And here's Emil Kirilov ready to beat you up. He's a really strong uh, guy. He did a bunch of work. Um, and he wasn't around for our first ACME measurement. But he, you know, he worked on the ACME experiment for, for several years. And he did a bunch of work demonstrating some improvements, uh, electrostatic focusing, rotational cooling, styrap state preparation, some photon cycling work, um, the thermochemical production. Um, you know, he, 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 he really gave, you know, added uh, to uh, our, our quiver you know, of different things we could try. And that's really kind of what this experimental pro a hallmark of this experimental program. There's people working all the time to try to improve the next generation, or maybe the generation after that. And so once we have enough you know, demonstrated arrows on our quiver, then we go ahead and make a measurement. That's the kind of idea. But all, all the work that's uh, done previously by, by many people you know, should not be forgotten. So uh, here's one of the improvements we made. Uh, we se separated the plates uh, wider. So we, the molecular beam comes in here between these two uh, transparent electric field plates. We opened the aperture so there's more solid angle going in. Uh, we want to keep the THO off of our field plate, so we've got to make the plates further apart. We've got to raise the voltages. We have to uh, try to improve the collection optic, because now we're slightly further away. So that it has all sorts of consequences. But in the end, this gives us uh, an improved uh, collection. Here's our uh, collimators. Here's our transparent electric field plates. And we gain a, a, about a factor of 8 in signal, okay, 8 in signal uh, by doing this. Another thing uh, we do is... Uh, we incre increase the uh, molecule detection uh, efficiency by changing how we're collecting the photons, but also how, uh, which state we read out. Remember, we read out the spin by pumping optically from the H state to some higher state, and then it emits a photon. Those are the photons we count. Uh, in the old uh, uh, scheme, we were uh, doing this with the C state, which emitted a 690 nanometer photon. And now we're using the I state, which has a shorter lifetime, but it's got a green photon, which in improves our uh, quantum efficiency. We add these uh, light pipes, and then instead of only having two uh, PMTs, we have eight PMTs, so we have larger collection area. So all together, oh, sorry, all together, all of this gives about a factor of 12 uh, in, in signal. This must be for just the, uh, the photons, sorry. Um, so that's great. Um, but it is complicated, because this has a shorter lifetime. We have to think about how to take data. Now uh, we, we digitize every single pulse. So we now have to take a lot more data, and we, uh, including the fact that we have uh, eight PMTs. So it, it, it has ramifications. It has a ripple effect. But we, we've, uh, we've, we've overcome that. And now we're going to also increase the uh, efficiency of oh, right, see, efficiency of state preparation. I'm sorry, I got the 12 confused. This is a factor of five for all of that together. Um, and we're also increasing the, the efficiency of state preparation. Well, how do we do this? Remember, we were before we were pumping out of the X state into the H state, and then we were driving uh, 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 the wrong state out using uh, optical pumping. Instead, the idea here is to use Styrap to drive uh, coherently through uh, uh, the C state into the particular spin projection that we're interested in. So it's just more efficient use of the, of the phase space of the molecule in the beginning. Uh, it's a known technique, but there are some huge challenges. There's a weak transition. The wavelengths differ by a factor of two, large Doppler width. It's hard. It was a hard thing to do. It was a really hard thing to do. What's the bottom line? So this is now data. Uh, this is about two weeks old. Three weeks old, I'm not sure. But here was our, our previous uh, pulse. Remember I showed you the data, we had this molecular pulse come through. Here was our previous, uh, uh, the pulse our, in our previous generation. And now here is the pulse for our current generation. Single pulse. And this is a log. Oh, that's a real one, I think, I hope. So uh, the demonstrated upgrades we have for ACME2 uh, is a statistical improvement of at least 300. It's actually higher than that, uh, which is great. Sorry, and this is, in, this is the gain in uh, 
uh, a signal, you take the square root of that to get the, uh, the EDM. What about systematics? I'm getting the, uh, I'm done, am I done? Yeah. I'm done. So uh, we, we did lots and lots of things to handle systematics. Um, they're listed there. Here is a projected uh, ACME uh, 2. Here is the projected ACME 3. This is now right here, right here. Now it's me. This is me making these statements, not the <laughs> collaboration. Uh, what is this going uh, to be? How are we going uh, to get to here? One is a thermochemical source. Uh, the thermochemical source, uh, we used uh, this knowledge. We know that if you mix thorium plus thorium dioxide and you apply heat to that solid mixture, THO comes directly off. And so uh, here is our uh, acne ablation source, and here is our uh, THO um, uh, uh, source, at least uh, theoretically. And I'll just say quickly, uh, this has been uh, demonstrated. Here's the pulse that we would get for our current uh, YAG, um, uh, our current YAG uh, source, and here is the pulse that we uh, get from our new uh, chemical source. So here's a kind of a typical flux we got for ACME 1, and around here is going to be the typical flux we get for ACME 2. So we get another a factor of 10 larger flux. All right, you ready? Foolproof plans for future ACMEs. So ACME SD, uh, advanced space based compression, optimized detection, who knows what else. Ha, ha, ha. So there he is. Uh, the Acme duper, super duper projected. Uh, so if you kind of make some kind of, you know, where you're fully molecule shot noise instead of photon shot noise, you end up there. And that truly is one PEV uh, sensitivity and, you know, and very broadly. Okay. Sorry. There's, a, there's an, an incredible group of people. These are the people that were working on the ground uh, this summer. Um, uh, everybody has really pitched in. Uh, uh, Brendan wasn't there this summer, but he's, uh, uh, he's back to, as of today. Um, and uh, Nick uh, Hutzler worked as a graduate student on the experiment, and now he's a postdoc in Conquan Ni. This is a uh, group. This is uh, Dave uh, DeMille, uh, Jerry Gabrielis, and myself were the three uh, PIs. And it's a mixture of uh, Yale uh, and Harvard, and uh, the uh, NSF funds this experiment. Thank you, and sorry for going over time. Not living, it's, it's a re way of, I think, making a reasonable projection of what will actually happen in an experiment. But if, 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 if you hit the limit with your apparatus, you know, like there's no more super dupers or whatever, then wouldn't you, you would say, well, let's integrate for a month or... And then yeah, like, maybe, or maybe you say, hey, oh, wait a second, we've got these three improvements that are on here, we can just... Step down, we're gonna to gotta to do this data analysis. It's gonna take time. Let's go ahead and put these other set of improvements in. It, we're asking almost like a sociological question. I think it actually has to do with students graduating. I think so. Yeah. So with this thermochemical source, can you just go CW? Um, yeah, potentially. Whether we want to go CW is a big open question. I don't think we do. Th yeah, there are other, yeah. no, no, no. The, the heating is a separate, but you know, we like to have very nice pulses that come out, right? That's right now that's how we're thinking of the experiment. You know, one pulse comes through and all this happens and the next pulse comes through. It starts kind of, you can think of it as overlapping pulses. You know, that might be okay, but we don't know. One more question? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a three question, or there's a three, kind of a three question is, you know, so you talk about, okay, you're, you're moving in this parameter space and you're kind of ruling out this CP violating phase in Susie, um, but of course, that triggers in my mind, you know, the same thing happening in uh, QCD, right? Uh, so is this is this a uh, yeah, or another right. another case for axions to save the day? Or? No, no, I, and I don't know why. Yeah, no, it's just it's just like oh, this doesn't make any sense. There is there are some theories, always theories. So there are some theories which somehow one of them was that it re required that these CP phases be small, um, but then there was oh right, and then what happened was the LAC actually did contribute. Uh, to that theory that couldn't be right because they didn't find something at some energy. Um, but other than that, I don't know of any kind of deep meaning if the, uh, if, you know, okay, the CP violating, are, they're zero, they're rigorously zero. I haven't heard of, of any prediction like that. Oh, maybe one quick 
quick one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay yeah. So you had those awe-inspiring uh, distributions that were at Galveston. <coughs> if you uh, prompting the question, well, if, I mean, if you have outlier tail, you know that at Galveston always. Yeah. Five, is that? I mean. Is that really an issue, or I, I would imagine not? I, I think uh, you, it's, it's Nick Hutzler over there. He can uh, address that, uh, af, you know, at, together. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah. So look, there were there were these outlying tails in previous EDM experiments. People didn't understood them. They just cut them off and gave an answer, yeah. which isn't so bad, yeah. but uh, it's now pretty much understood uh, about what those uh, those those tails were, and uh, we fully understand our statistics. But Nick, Nick is. Uh, do you ha is the paper out, or is there? No, paper's not out. It's, it's, in, it's in Nick's thesis. No. All right. Well, we better move on. Let's thank uh, John again.